old-time classic, Bob Mackie. I'm hoping to build some new classics. I'm working on it. Um, I, I think evening is a time to, to get dressed up and go out and, and make an entrance and feel good about yourself and, and, and know that you look good. I think a woman likes to step out of her everyday clothes and, and become someone else, have a different mood. So a whole fantasy, romantic mood is very important. Hedy Lamarr, Greta Garbo, and Marlena Dietrich, those three ladies I thought had a great deal of style and, and a look in the films that we don't have today. We don't have anybody like that, except maybe my little darling Cher. She comes closest. She likes to dress, and she likes to have a good time, and she likes to turn heads. Oh, I'm not only a fan, I'm a friend, and so, and this is the first fashion show of his that I've ever been to. It's the only time I've ever been in the same city where he was, so I, I came really to be supportive and, you know, I think that most of all. Glamour has to come with the woman, you know, you can't sell them glamour. I mean, you can sell them a, a glamorous dress, and if they don't wear it right and pull it off, then, then a woman isn't glamorous. Unfortunately, I wish you could sell it in a bottle, and they could just, you know, dab a little behind the ears every day and come out looking, you know, like some fabulous creature, but it doesn't work that way. They have to work on it a little harder than that. I never guarantee you're going to get instant glamour from, from a fancy dress, you know, because if that dress isn't right for you, then you don't look good. So I think women have to kind of analyze themselves and decide what's going to make them look glamorous. I think a little Hollywood never hurt anyone. I wouldn't, I don't say you do Hollywood all day long, but there are times when, when you want to, you know, transport yourself to another place and have a little fantasy in your life and, and feel extra special. Luxury looks, glamorous dressing like you've never seen it before. Dramatic in other ways, in, in more sculptural ways, you know, because that is what I, I that is what I see myself as ultimately. Her neckline looks biggish. The front, the front neckline looks big. I oh, will get to that. Just let me. Where's my magnetic pin holder? which I love. At 27 years of age, with only two collections under his belt, Isaac Mizrahi is New York's latest fashion discovery. Working out of a small studio in the artistic quarter of the city, the young designer creates clothes for young executives in a sophisticated but uncomplicated way. Mm -hmm. You were uh, showing me before glitzy. that? What, glitzy? Uh, is that and glittery. Glittery, okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I think of it as glitz, but it's, it's great, too. My clothes are not fickle clothes. They're I always like to think very classic, you know. They're clothes that are very American. They are, I hope, very original. These are great big rings. Ultimately, fashion is an art form that is directly related to the real world. You know what I mean? Um, you can't expect, one of the great joys, I think, as a designer is actually people wearing the clothes. You know, when you see the clothes on the street or when you see the clothes like last night, for instance, seeing Liza in that dress, I mean, it just really, that is one of the greatest feelings of satisfaction. Ms. Rohi created a special gown for Liza Minnelli to wear when she recently presented him with the Perry Ellis Award for new fashion talent. Wonderful. I think it's a lot to live up to, though. I mean, will, you, will the um, pressure be on after being recognized in this way? Yes, I do, and yet I don't usually think about that. I think about more the creation of the clothing and uh, my love of clothing and every way of expressing myself when I create a collection, really. That's what it is for me. I think it is a great pleasure and really an honor to present the first Perry Ellis Award to David Cameron. Two years ago, David Cameron was another promising talent who won the same award. Last year, he filed for bankruptcy, unable to match business savvy with the industry hype. 
I understand that you're pretty adamant about playing your cards right, about doing things the right way in terms of business, and, and don't get too carried away with all that's happening to you. I think that keeping it exclusive has a lot to do with that. You know what I mean? Not trying to take over the world overnight. You know what I mean? I really don't think that... Uh, that anyone would sneeze at the figures we've been shipping out and the figures that we've been booking and yet you see a very slow very deliberate very careful progression cotton sash maybe not fringed Ooh, isn't that a good idea a chambray striped sash oh boy oh boy huh you have to love this industry and love clothes and these objects and accessories more than anything else you know you have to love the the idea of creation more than you love the idea of uh you know a great deal of publicity or becoming a star or making a million dollars you know i'm not in you know i'm not in it for any of those reasons i'm in it just because i love designing clothes and conceiving a look for a season and presenting a collection that way Rahi, who grew up in Brooklyn, was exposed to the industry at an early age. His father was a manufacturer of children's clothes, and his mother a great fashion enthusiast. If it's possible to do such a thing, she uh, taught me, or she exposed me to taste at a very young age. You know, and discernment, like being able to say, this is bad, and this is good. This is beautifully made, this is not beautifully made, you know. This is something that I will wear here and it's very serious. This is something that I will wear on the weekend and it's not serious, I throw it away. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's that kind of like, you know, thing that you learn, I think, at a very young age. I think the formative years of anyone's experience is what makes them into the artist that they eventually become. Maybe we could do like a stripe and a solid. We could do like together, reversing. That's a good one. What do you think of that? Perfect. So they can wear the stripe on the outside, the stripe on the inside. I am very fortunate to have years of experience in the business before I started this business with designers, Perry Ellis, whom I started with, and then Jeffrey Banks, and then Calvin um, Klein, Calvin Klein. And there you learn a great deal about timing and about shipping at the right moment and appearing at the right moment. I mean, it's all... It's all timing, I think. Isaac, I would imagine that the pressure is really on you now. You're being hailed a hero on 7th Avenue, like an incredible sensation. Are these things hard to live up to? When I'm working, I'm much more comfortable. I mean, you could, I could have a show every day. I don't feel the pressure. I feel the pressures that I feel are only creative ones in a funny way, you know. Of course, I worry about reviews. I worry about buyers. I worry about sell-throughs. If I didn't, I wouldn't be human, but... As far as feeling pressures and doing things because I feel pressures, I don't. I only feel my own personal creative pressures and my own pressures of perfect, you know, that I want to be perfect. to the royal family. Elizabeth was queen. On her coronation day, the gloves worn by the Queen of England were designed by Cornelia James. The association with the monarch and her family spans over 40 years and has been instrumental in the company's success. To have a royal warrant, you have to have the, supplied a product personally to a member of the royal family for at least um, a period of three years on a fairly continuous basis. And uh, Mother started really after the war in England. She realized that, that people were desperate, women were desperate to have 
some colour and some life put into what was very drab clothing when she produced a range of gloves in a hundred shades of colour, which could literally brighten up any outfit, and she became, sort of, she became called the colour queen of England. And <laughs> but at the same time, she started producing couture gloves um, for people like Hardy Amos and Norman Hartnell, and they were making outfits for the royal family, particularly for the Queen and the Queen Mother, and they asked her to make the gloves. Peter James joined the family business in the late 70s, but still manages a career as a writer of best-selling thriller novels, which always include a reference to Cornelia James' gloves and accessories. Yes, I always figured that Alfred Hitchcock could appear in his own movies, and, and my mother's gloves should appear in all my books. I either have her gloves or her scarves. I always have the heroine wearing Cornelia James gloves or Cornelia James scarves in possession. I've got her agonizing over a choice of... I've, I've, I've been really bad in the book in terms of a commercial plug because I've got the heroine opening a drawer and her late son has given her this entire drawer full of Cornelia James scarves and she says, gosh, she was a snob. He would only ever buy her the best. <laughs> Cornelia James, of course. The name is so well respected that practically everyone in the entertainment industry goes to Cornelia James when they need gloves. I'm so beautiful. <laughs> I'm pumping iron. Obi-Wan is here. The force is with him. By happy chance, or perhaps it was careful design, she'd chosen an outfit in the exact shade of yellow worn exclusively by succeeding patient as a top design force has taken a nosedive she was replaced last month by 25 year old mark jacobs who's had success with his own line we'll have an interview with the young designer on an upcoming show but for now here's a look at patricia pastor's final collection has made his mark designing for the likes of Princess Diana, it's glamour American style he advocates, even though most British may not quite be ready for it. They have other things which, which are considered to be far more priority than, than um, wearing, having a beautiful dress made. Mm -hmm. And they don't want to stand yeah, out. Every day. This is from the spring collection. This is all spring, yeah. Is that how you'd show it with a straw belt like that? Yeah, well, I was pulling a shirt with straw, that. yeah, and straw, um, big it's straw like hats. elegant in the evening and that sort of, you know, the contrast. And we'd like to make it a bit sort of, you know, try and cash these things up a little bit, you know, so they don't look too um, restricted, don't we? Yes, we do. Quite right. Cinema Verite. <coughs> Bruce Oldfield has come a long way from the orphanage where he grew up. The 38-year-old originally studied to be a teacher, but switched to a design school where he was considered something of a wonderkind. In the mid-1970s, the designer opened his own shop, and today his pricey couture and ready-to-wear creations sell to glamorous ladies worldwide. I mean, I like glamour. You know, but I mean, the English don't like glamour. So again, you think, what the hell am I doing in England? Well, how do you explain it? I mean, what uh, what gave you that appetite for glamour? Oh, I think when I was when I was a kid, um, I was I was brought up in the north east of England, which you know, as it is now, is a little bit depressed. You know, in the fifties. That make me sound old. <laughs> no, I'm from the fifties uh, too. Okay, my okay, dear. okay. <laughs> right in the fifties. And on television, there was always sort of Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers movies and things like that. And that is what I was brought up on. And, you know, that's, um, 
I think, where I got it all from. Because it was quite an incredible escapism, you know, at that time to be watching old Fred and Ginge sort of dressed up to the nines. And I just loved all that glamour. Well, something that I thought was pretty intriguing just earlier about the, the British fashion scene oh, and yeah. why this is sort of a frustrating kind of country to be in for a designer. Yeah, well I think it's frustrating because a lot of the good ideas come out of England. I mean, you even pick up Women's Wear Daily and they, although they're always slagging England off, they always say, you know, England is the hotbed for ideas, which I believe it is, because we have very good art schools and they turn out a lot of talent. The only problem is that that talent's got nowhere to go. Usually it goes to Europe, you know. Most of the European fashion houses are jam-packed with English graduates. Um, because here you can't manufacture anything very easily, you know. They've got two tapes. They've got two tapes. Then they'll say, Ladies and gentlemen, that was Bruce Oldfield, and then off you go. Uh -huh, okay, fine. But I think if you play it like this... Okay. Darling, don't give me aggravation. I've told everybody that needs to be told, okay? Just do it as I say, and it'll be fabulous. Lovely. You very much. See you later. See you later. Have a rest. Oldfield was one of two English designers asked to appear at Australia's Bicentennial Fashion Gala last year and received added recognition when the Princess of Wales turned up in one of his gowns. Everybody thinks there's this incredible mystique about the Princess of Wales, you know, which of course there is. I mean, it's a great honor to make things for the Princess, but um, she is just a woman like, I was going to say like you and me, but like, she's just, <laughs> just an ordinary woman like you, you know, I mean, she's... Um, who, who needs certain things for certain occasions. She just happens to have more occasions than most of us, you know. Um, and so obviously it is a question of, you know, um, well, I'll say, you know, let's slash it to the waist, and she'll say, let's slash it to the shoulder blades, you know, you know, <laughs> something like that. You know, it's, um, it's always a two-way thing, you know. Um, Nobody wants a fight. Really. <laughs> it's like, you know, you will wear red, I won't, you will. I actually like bright colors, funnily enough, you know. I mean, I tend to do a lot of bright colors, but, um, Obviously, for, for spring, I think we've gone very black and white. I do a lot of black and I do a lot of white. I don't normally. Honest. <laughs> Honest. But it sells. Yeah. It sells, it sells, it sells. You know, there are times when you think, oh, you know, what's it all about? But um, then once you actually start getting into a collection and sort of playing around, then, you know, it sort of it becomes, you know, you get carried along with it. I like it. Every show, do you worry about what the press is going to say, whether the collection will sell or not? Do you think that way? Do you, do you care? I guess it would be only human to wonder. Yeah, no, you do care. You do care. So it, it's awful when they're nasty to you. I was, <laughs> you know, I, they think, oh God, they can say anything about the designers. I wish we could sue some of the more <laughs> scurrilous members of the press, but of course you can't. Um, I'd almost rather they didn't come. You know, they weren't going to say anything. You know, I'd rather say nothing. You know, come, say nothing. If you don't like it, don't have to say anything, you know. Because, I mean, <clears throat> one has suffered the slings and barbed arrows of some of the, particularly the American press, actually. You know, some, are, some love you and some hate you. And there's some that hate you and, and go on hating you. And you wonder, well, what earth is the matter with you, you stupid uptight bitch? <laughs> Why don't you just not bother coming? I usually find that if the press really like a collection, it isn't going to sell. Oh. That's interesting. Yeah. Why do you suppose that is? Um, probably because it's too avant-garde, it's too before its time, it's too directional, or it's too, um, it's too press-worthy. Really nice length, too. Is that the length that uh, you show as well as ship at? <laughs> the length we show, but it's not the length we ship. But they still want longer. <laughs> they want it longer. Yeah, it'll be down here, you know, by the time we've added two oh, inches. God. Yeah, and that sort of ruins your uh, concept too. Uh, totally, you know, it's not totally. Like it's supposed to look like that. It's a horror story. What can you do? Yeah. It's, if they want to buy, if you want them to buy it, you've got to do that. Otherwise, you know, you can be a purist and, no, and yeah, you can sit with a lot of cloth. You know, starve in the garret. Yeah, yeah. Which is not really. I'm too old. Right?
Forbes magazine does in America, the French weekly Nouvelle Observateur has come out with its annual list of the 200 wealthiest people in France. Way down the list in the 114th spot is Yves Saint Laurent, who's worth an estimated $76 million US. In 58th place are the brothers at Louis Vuitton, with about $150 million each, while Pierre Cardin comes close to the top in 16th position and a fortune of over $300 million US.